Okay, so I am uh, going to call uh, the next uh, panel, which I am honored to be also, uh, well, maybe a bit unfortunate for them that I am their moderator. So May from Eventus, founder of Eventus, please. And Lina, uh, co-founder of Mom's World. And then Talal, uh, founder, co-founder of Bezat, please. Pleasure. Um, thank you for showing up. Uh, we have 20 minutes, as we did in the first one, and I am happy that I'm able to sit down. Uh, look, still, can you hear me? You're still, your, your early stage startups, in my view, two, three years, maybe four years, you have gone through uh, many way too many challenges that uh, uh, from the very early days in building the business I want so I'll ask one general question and maybe a second general question but I want to give people uh, the feeling of uh, uh, of who you are uh, how why is it did you feel that you wanted to go out and actually build a business specifically in the space that you are in so you're you're, you're, uh, my, I'll start with you. You are, uh, you will, you know, so everybody knows Eventus, so we don't want to pitch on the company because we want to get deep into it. What is it that got you to do what you're doing? You're, you're a software engineer and you wanted to change something. You felt a pain point somewhere. What happened? Yeah, so basically I was at an event and I felt the event is run very manual. Like, I want to meet you at the event and Where, no, like no, that step? you... No, 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 not a step. <laughs> it was a startup weekend. So uh, I felt the pain, like every, this is a networking event. Everyone from the people at the event, they are going to network, they want to meet people and there's a lot of changes and last minute changes and updates happen to the agenda and everything and the event was done very manual. And also at the same time, I attended a conference and exhibition. And every time I go to exhibition, I end up with a bag full of flyers and papers and it's, I, I never go and, and I never fi yeah, and you find them or go through them again. So I felt like there should be something done for events that it has to be run more efficiently for the attendees and for the organizers. But is it this something that has been done somewhere else? Do you, or did you feel that the region was neglected in it and you felt that you wanted to do something here in your, well, you started in Egypt, I'm guessing. So uh, uh, you felt that why not originate a startup that addresses that issue here? When we started, we didn't have like a lot of event apps or something, so the space was new, was still developing, like worldwide. Uh, so we did our, our research, we did like a lot of, uh, we attended a lot of events like worldwide, so we wanted to know, understand the market, understand the technology for it. And then uh, we felt like we as Egyptian company or the Middle East uh, talent, we can do anything. So we want to build something that can be used anywhere. Uh, we are not any less of like, the people who build startups and, and it's used by events or by users like anywhere in the world. So I felt like we should do something here. I, our, our dream for Eventus from day one is to build a company from the heart of Cairo or the Middle East and go global. And you're in many places and we'll come back to that. Lena, so you graduate from uh, Cambridge, I'm guessing. You spent, you lived seven years in Saudi Arabia. These are the things I wanna mention because people need to feel that and you become a co-founder of Mom's World. So Mom's World is also a, a, a growing company. It's creating an impact. Uh, you're moving here to Dubai, I'm guessing. So stuff is happens. You're a, you're a mother also. And so what, tell us about the challenges and why, uh, why not focus on being a mother and, or, or become a co-founder? What, what happens? How do, you, how, how do you manage these challenges? So, um, I don't know if this is working, but yeah. So I think you go to a show with your kids and the magician takes the rabbit out of the hat and you know, half of the people are enjoying the experience and you're sitting there with your kid going, how did he do that? And for the next 10 minutes, you're solving a problem. And if that's just part of your DNA, wherever you go, whatever environment you're in, you're always seeking to solve a problem. And I think one of the biggest challenges of my life was becoming a mother. I was an investment banker, doing M&A deals, not sleeping for endless days, flying after I had a half an hour break and getting on a plane and meeting investors. And then when I became a mom, I thought, shit, this is a lot, lot harder than anything I've ever done in my life. 
and I need help. Now, luckily, I spoke English, and I lived in London when I had my three, so information was difficult to find, but it was available. When I moved to Saudi, someone said to me that, do you realize that all these moms in Saudi don't have access to the information you have, and therefore, they can't be good moms? And that was really upsetting. I think that was one of the biggest pieces of news I've heard that really changed. How could you be a bad mom just because you don't have access to information? That's awful. And you know, as a mom, you always feel that you're running and trying your best to provide the best for your kids. But what if you can't reach it? And what if all it is, it's information? It's not even good. You don't have a monetary barrier. It's just not being able to read another language. And most of the information when I had my kids was published in English. Now it's improved a lot, but it's still Arabic is lagging greatly. And as parents, we need to empower other parents to be able to provide that great you know, upbringing for their kids. So, thank you. I'll, I'll get back to you on a couple of points you mentioned, but uh, Talal, so you're, you've started your business uh, three years ago, I, I should say. Yeah. Uh, you, you started in a certain space and then you pivoted a little bit. And uh, y y y why did you feel you needed to pivot? What is, what is, uh, where is the thinking of, uh, fast thinking of a, an entrepreneur that says, I need to pivot and need to move fast into another area. And why is it that you think you are in the right space now? And maybe you can explain a little bit what you do. So you're in insurance and you're in comparison and human resource management around medical uh, insurance, I'm guessing. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, I mean, we're, we're very data driven and what excites us is solving problems and giving people a better experience. So what we saw was initially we were a comparison site for financial services and uh, we quickly learned that, you know, the experience was not only uh, really horrible when it came to purchasing and finding the right product, but then also the post-purchase phase. Um, and then when we looked at health insurance specifically, uh, you know, it's a very important product. People spend a lot of time trying to find the right policy. So when people came to our website, uh, they were spending much more time looking for health insurance than any other product, their time on the site. So I was very, very obvious that this was a, a very crucial uh, value proposition that we could provide to people. And from there, you know, we saw another problem. We said, let's solve this problem. It makes a lot of sense. Our clients come to us and they ask us, can you help us with this and this? Um, and, you know, as long as it fits within our vision, we obviously want to do everything we can to give people a better experience. Right. So, and tell me how, I know you've raised money early on, and uh, so I'm going to go through a series of, of the challenges that, on, that founders and entrepreneurs have. So, uh, I'm going back this way. So, Talal, you, you launch a business, you raise money, and then you go back to your, what, your, your shareholders and say, I'm... I'm iterating, I'm pivoting. How do they react? And then is, how big is, that, is fundraising a, a challenge for you? Uh, and this is a question for, for, for everyone. Um, I mean, fundra fundraising is obviously very challenging, uh, but I, we're very okay. lucky uh, with the fact that you know, we met the right VC early on. How, how do you um, know that you met the right VC? Because they gave you money? Because uh, they gave you money I'm and we're still friends. Right. And we're still friends. So I think that counts for, for yeah. a lot. Um, but to be honest with you, I mean, as an entrepreneur, I, I think uh, there's the concept of risk homeostasis, right? So uh, people who wear a seatbelt drive faster and riskier than people who don't wear a seatbelt. Right. So the fact that we raised money, um, we started taking more risks, right? And uh, obviously they're very calculated risks, but when we were able to show our shareholders that uh, the unit economics makes sense, at the end of the day, that's what we're in business so, so for. So it's unit economics is, matters a lot. I mean, what, what else matters for, for investors? Um, what did you need, what, what is it that triggered their interest in you? So uh, we weren't smarter than people because we got in, into insurance. It was really a lot of luck. Um, obviously we made the most of our luck. Um, but I think in this region, a lot of industries, you know, people are afraid that this industry is not scalable or it's not of a significant size. Um, but then obviously insurance is one of the 800 pound gorillas, right? So uh, the market size was very obvious. We didn't have to have too many discussions about the addressable market. But really what, what it came down to was this is our cost of acquisition and this is the lifetime value okay. we're getting from the customer. Yeah, thank you. And May, I know you're fundraising and it, it, you, you've had... You, well, you sat with Obama, so my, my, 
was on a panel with Obama, and uh, she became famous. But were you and able to raise more to money on because a, on of a, it? On a first panel with you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this is our, my first, my first panel, panel with you. me. But I hope you were more successful with me than you are with Obama. Because are you able? Uh, so tell us about, I mean, I know it's a challenge to fundraise. So what, what is it that you're facing? Uh, do you need to knock on doors? Uh, does it frustrate you? Are there people interested? What, what, what's happening? Is there money in the region or is it there? There is money in the region, but I think, so I will tell you a little bit about our background. So we started Eventus, we decided to put Strap for one year until we have like the product, we, we have some traction. So we approached investors, but we, are, we weren't asking for money. And then once we had this traction and early paying customers, we raised uh, seed funding from Vodafone Ventures and Cairo Engines. And that's, that was in Cairo. All our customers were in Cairo. And then we wanted to grow, we wanted to scale, and we wanted to fundraise to scale. And that was very, very challenging. Like raising from Egyptian investors, it was very hard for them to pay money for us to come to Dubai and try a new market. And for Dubai-based or regional investors, it was very challenging as well because they want us to move to Dubai first and prove something, prove that we can tab into the market. So we were like in the middle. We can't get like one investor. Right. Uh, we were very lucky as well. Like we met some investors and we got that. Um, and we, we had to fake it, like we had to like bootstrap as well the moving to Dubai. You have to bootstrap uh, all the time and keep knocking on doors yes, all the time. Yes, and then once you prove something, once you have clients and you have traction and you have gross, it's a bit easier the to start the conversation. A little exactly, bit faster. but still it's very, I would say very long, very stressful. <laughs> You know, yeah, it takes like it takes a lot of time, um, and I think the most important thing for startups, especially in our region, like we need we need money faster because we need to grow faster and we need to tap into the market. We need to go aggressive, especially and you feel in investors our investors are risk averse. Yes, um, they worried. They want you to prove like everything first, and then, and then they, they take the risk. And they don't know that you you need to get the money exactly. so that you prove it. Exactly. So it's a chicken and an egg thing. Exactly. So I think the startups like. You have, to, you have to act anyway, so right. you have to move anyway. Right. And Lena, so I'm, I'm going to ask you a different question. Uh, you launched the business uh, with Muna, uh, doing well here in Dubai. It's easy to start a business in Dubai. I, any entrepreneur that comes to me, I tell them, don't tell me you are launching in Dubai. It's good, but that's not where you get tested. So you're, I know you're moving to Saudi Arabia, and you're in a different business. You're in the moving of goods. Uh, and that's the most difficult thing, I think, because I lived 35 years in that business, if you remember. Um, tell me about the challenge of crossing borders. Uh, how do you handle that? How do you actually, and Saudi Arabia is such a massive market, but it's such an opportunity. Uh, and, but it's also so challenging to cross borders. Tell us about that challenge, and how do investors react to you when you come to them and say, Dubai, and they tell you, well, I want Saudi Arabia. I think the challenge of Saudi Arabia is not a movement challenge, although the lack of information around Saudi makes Saudi really daunting. So Saudi is actually a very nice country. As the Kareem uh, you know, speaker said, I really did enjoy Saudi. I love being there, and I actually didn't find doing business there very difficult. The lack of information makes it very difficult. It will seem like a difficult place to but do business. But tell me, what does that mean, lack of information? On all, on all accounts, if you just want to open a phone, you get a phone line. It's really hard. The information available doesn't match the reality on the ground. You know, do you want to send goods across the border? You, do you want a full list of information you need? Everybody tells you something different. But once you've established yourself and you know how the system works, it's very, very straightforward. The only problem is if you try to apply European methodology onto Saudi, it doesn't work. You just have to have a different mentality and say, I'm in a different environment. And therefore, I will operate with the new environment's rules. So the movement of goods hasn't been a challenge. In fact, one of the biggest suppliers we deal with is not able to sell goods into Saudi. So he's using us as a channel because we can move goods for him and he can't. And simply, he's trying to apply international rules onto a very local market. And I always look at Saudi and I think Saudi, Turkey, and China are very similar. They're very inward looking. They set their own rules when they think they think in their own language. So when you're trying to approach a market like that, you have to become one of them and walk the walk and really see where people go to malls, what they do, and how they operate. And once you try to operate 
you know, if I tried to apply what I did in London, in Saudi, I definitely would fail. Clearly, and, and so even though we're speaking in English, we're in an Arab yeah. city, but in Saudi Arabia, if you speak in English, you're not gonna sell anything, right? Actually, yesterday, I'm on a group of uh, e-commercers in Saudi, and I wrote a sentence in, in English, and I got, I said, and they literally said, they fired this group you. only speaks Arabic, and I actually said, thank you so much, I'm so glad that we can keep this rule. It's fantastic. And you know, as a mom, I force my kids to speak Arabic. So I think it's a great, great thing that we use our language. But that's a demand in the market. So yeah, that's the biggest demand. So another challenge, uh, Talal, is, is talent. Yeah. Uh, startups have a huge issue in recruiting talent. Not because there is no talent, in my view, and maybe you can uh, contradict me, but talent goes to big companies, so they want to work for Google, they want to work for Facebook, they want to work for government, they want to work for big companies, secure jobs. Uh, are you, what do you do? How do you actually bring people to work for you? And this question will go to all, to all of you. It's, when, when we ask entrepreneurs, they tell us our biggest challenge is not only raising money, but finding talent. Um, it's definitely a challenge. So we grew on January 1st, 2016, we were 10 employees. By the end of the year, we were 45 employees. Um, so obviously it took wow. a lot out of us. Um, Did I you spend your time only recruiting? Pretty much. Actually, our 10th hire was an HR manager, which was uh, a very lucky move. I'm, I'm happy we did that. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at our company, the average age is probably 27, 28 years old. Wow. So things are changing, right? Are they um, older than you or younger than you? Uh, half <laughs> and half. I made sure I hired some older people. So I don't right. feel so old myself. Yeah. Um, but what we found was people, you know, these days are really looking at what's the vision of the company, um, what's the culture like. I think that's something. So that we, that they get they interview you rather than you interview them. Absolutely, absolutely. And in Dubai, we have something uh, really great going for us um, because which we've is? actually been able to import a lot of talent. Which is it's a very international. Well, the city. multinational. Business. So if you look at uh, our our company, we have 25 different nationalities. And when you go talk to people in Europe or, or India or, or the MENA region and you tell them our company has so many different cultures, it's actually very attractive to people. This Fantastic. Day. Lina? So, um, How many so people work at, at Mom's World now? Over 60. 60. Yeah. And that's, that's grew tremendously that's in the past two years. Yeah. How, how did you get people to work for so, you? Why? So there are two parts to hiring people. So hiring technology people remains a challenge. But outside that, being a site dedicated to moms and really being focused on the vision has served us a lot in hiring. We, ha we do a lot of what they call returnships, which is mothers coming back to work. We so you have female male balance or all females? You're, you don't hire men. <laughs> it's a great question. We get asked that question. When will a man answer the phone? But <laughs> <laughs> who, wants, no. who wants to answer phones anyway? So um, we do have a lot of male uh, colleagues. But, but they're in the warehouse. <laughs> Carrying They're boxes. in the office, um, but we do, we do have a big proportion of returnships, which are moms coming back to work, Fantastic. and they're juggling. And the so like you, like and like Muna. Yeah, and it's great because they have a lot of skill, and it doesn't mean that they took a break to be a mom. They've lost the skill base. The only thing we continue to have a challenge with is technology people, but I think the region as a it's whole. It's a global issue. Yeah. But, but then you suddenly found a wealth of talent when you tap into a place where people don't think of, you know, mothers that are, that left work for some reason and could come back. Yeah. May, what's, did, are you able to recruit? What do you do? Do you give stock options? Do you tell them you love them every morning so that they come <laughs> and work for you? Yeah, everything, all of the above. <laughs> No, I mean, did you find a challenge? Um, you know, Egypt is a massive market with, with 90 million people and a lot of tech graduates. Are you able to recruit them? What, what's, what, is that a challenge? It's one of the biggest challenges, yes. Uh, and I think and why? the biggest challenge actually is not only hiring, it's retaining uh, the talents. Uh, because once they are in, they got very excited, they work for like six months, eight months. And, and they then leave, why? They get paid a little bit more. Uh, no, they actually, my own challenge is they don't, they leave the country. So they don't? They leave the company, uh, the country. So they move from Egypt. Uh, because Egypt. you have another challenge. Yeah. yeah, so they move from Egypt to some to Dubai. Is Dubai a challenge? Um, we only have one person move to, from Cairo to Dubai, but we have like four or five move to Berlin. Um, and yeah, so like which, Turkey. Which tells us that talent is a global challenge because 
uh, it has no geography, it's, it's not bound, people will pack their bags and go. Yeah. And it's, it's the largest asset in a company. Uh, I think, Yanni, we try to overcome this by... Is that your biggest challenge, all of you? Really? Uh, recruiting and retaining? So, sorry, can I... Yeah. It's not even recruiting and training our own people. I think across the board, as you, we have over 800 partners. If you look at how the challenge is impacting all our relationship, the quality of the recruitment impacts every single link Mums World has. So if they're not able to recruit, you even have a weak link with your partner. Fantastic. So, uh, Talal, go ahead. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think every other challenge you face uh, pales in comparison to the human you challenge. Absolutely. And I'm sure this resonates very well with, with our audience here. May, Lina, Talal, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.